perfect so let's talk about attacks on uh, cyber physical systems so we have the usual state update equation If you recall, this is actuation noise and this is observation noise. And then we have like, we have the U of T which is gamma of t of y12 yd this is var control policy Okay, so going back to this uh, room, this is my temperature inside the room. This is what the air handling unit is doing inside the room. This is the actuation noise. So do you remember what all are, were the actuation noise for this room's temperature? So there is number of people in the room, number of computers in the room. If there's anything being cooked or any hot item within the room, um, there's nothing here actually, this is just a classroom, so there isn't much any, there isn't any cooking happening, but all the lights are creating some amount of uh, increase in temperature of, uh, inside the room, so that's my actuation noise. And then the observation is the temperature plus some observation noise. So in the case of observation for this particular room, we have like a thermostat in the back of the room, and that thermostat is actually measuring what the temperature of the room is and there is some amount of noise but in the case of this thermostat the noise is actually very small so in comparison to xt the magnitude of vt is actually very very small uh, what we are observing or what the computer is observing or in this case what the thermostat is observing is a whole bunch of the sequence of uh, 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 temperatures that it has taken and then it applies a policy gamma t and comes up with what the air handling unit should be doing at this particular point of time. Now we want to envision an attack on this particular system, this thermal system that is inside this room. Uh, what all things can go wrong? If you are an adversary, put yourself in adversary shoes. Uh, you might be sitting somewhere inside the Dries lab, you might be sitting somewhere away from the Dries lab. What all things can you influence within this room? that is going to create an attack scenario uh, for this particular room. So ultimately the goal of attack is to make people uncomfortable inside this room, right? So that's our goal as an attacker. We want to do something which creates uncomfortable situation for people inside the room. What all things can you do as an attacker? You will increase the set point. Uh, you can increase the set point of the room. What would that amount to in this model? Actually, in this model, the set point is not there, but uh, the XT is essentially error between the set point and the. Okay, let's let's uh, write it as. Uh, influence the set point.
what else can you do influence the measurement so you can put your hand in front of the thermostat so you can change y tilde t equals to you can also do actually you can also do y tilde t So you add more noise to the system, okay? So you can change the observation by two ways. One is you just pick a different observation function itself. The other is you add more and more higher intensity noise to the observation sensor. So in this case, you have a thermostat. It has a temperature sensor and you're just going to increase the noise around the temperature sensor so that it sends wrong temp temperature reading to the controller. What else can you do? Assume all of this is internet connected. Assume all communication is happening through wires. Com some communication channel. Yeah. You can disrupt forces and all. Ah, okay. So you can disrupt communication. So either drop yt or ut so if you think about a vehicle the way the vehicle uh, the subcomponents within the vehicle communicates is through a broadcast channel called a can bus so whenever there is a communication happening in the can bus everybody else is supposed to keep quiet they cannot send any message on the can bus and then when the message gets finished then somebody else which is in the queue to send the message it will start sending the message on the can bus if two components start communicating at the same time it's called a collision and then one of the components will stop sending information the other component will send the information and then the uh, other communication is going to start so in that case both the yt the sensor reading that goes back to the controller and the control signal that goes back to the actuator goes to the actuator both of this are broadcasted on the can bus and if you are you remember that video that i showed you where they were sending information on the can bus through the infotainment system in the g pack so what they were actually doing is uh, the communication the infotainment system was also on the same can bus it was sending information on the same can bus so what they did was they sent started sending commands through the CAN bus itself. As a result of which, none of the authentic communication that was supposed to happen. So who was supposed to give the authentic communication to the brake or to the accelerator? It was the driver inside the vehicle. So the driver's action was not transmitted to the actual actuator and that's because of their, them being able to disrupt the communication within that CAN bus system. Okay, so disrupting communication means that either you either the adversary can drop yt which is observation that is getting fed to the controller or it can observe it can disrupt ut like it can drop ut which means the action will not get applied to the actuator what else can be done the yeah that's same as disrupting communication You can also add a huge actuation noise to the system. So for instance, in the case of this particular room, you can just light a fire or something, I don't know, put the room on fire. Uh, that's not a cyber attack. but you can actually imitate that through a remote sensor wherein you are uh, actually in actuation noise, the state itself has to change. Um, 
typically this kind of thing will happen when you are attacking a transformer system or a smart grid system. Uh, like uh, to give you an example, some people, not us, not, not, uh, not in my group, but some people that I know of, uh, they're looking at attacking the electric grid using the DC charger, the, what is DC charger called? The high speed charger, what are those called? Superchargers. So what they are trying to do, what they are thinking about is, we have a supercharger, that supercharger is actually connected to the internet because that's how the billing and payment and all of that happens. So what they are wondering is, I have a vehicle, I'm going to tamper with the vehicle, and whenever the vehicle gets connected to the supercharger, I'm going to send some random commands to the supercharger, like start charging, stop charging, start charging, stop charging. Or if I can actually communicate with the supercharger, then I'm going to offload a, a program which is going to create some complicated charging uh, waveform. And in that case, Remember that supercharger itself is connected to a transformer which itself is connected to the grid. So it can create like ripple effects uh, from the supercharging station to the transformer station to the grid and it can cause grid destabilization. So now of course one supercharger may not cause grid stabilization but if you put your car on like 10 superchargers connected to the same transformer, you can actually create quite a bit of uh, complications for that grid. And if you look at the future, if you think about the future, people are imagining that in Walmart parking lot, there will be like 20 superchargers. In Target parking lot, there will be like 10 superchargers. So now imagine like all those 10 superchargers are attacked at the same time. That's going to create problem. So that's equivalent to saying that I'm going to add actuation noise onto the grid and then cause grid to destabilize. Why is it an actuation noise? So if you think about it, from a grid perspective, how much electricity we should generate, how much electricity we should consume, all of that is determined, that's your XT, but if a vehicle comes and joins that grid and starts charging, that's just a noise on the grid, because grid is very big. And what you're doing is just adding a vehicle, a vehicle is a very small uh, consumer of the electricity that gets generated, so that's the actuation noise, and in that case, uh, you can destabilize the grid or at least the, the thing people are worried about, whether it's a legitimate worry or not, is something that's not known, but people are trying to figure out what are the legitimate worries there, is whether I can use multiple electric vehicles, multiple compromised electric vehicles to destabilize the grid or not. So that's something people are thinking about. And Department of Energy is investing quite a bit of money to understand the cybersecurity component of this whole fast charging systems. Anything else that I can do? So I've talked about dropping information, I've talked about, oh, I've not talked about changing the control input itself. So just like you can change observation, you can change control input itself. This was the, the Jeep Cherokee attack. So the, the difference between these two things is, in the case of disrupting communication, you are either letting the information pass through or you are dropping the information completely. In the case of changing control input, I am just trying to break the car but instead the car is actually accelerating. So I'm literally changing the control input that is getting applied on the vehicle. Okay, so that's changing control input. You can also have uh, stealthy attacks. So stealthy attacks, what they try to do is uh, and we'll get into the formulations of stealthy attack a little later, but because it's a bit advanced topic. But the idea is that you create an attack that is not observed at the, at the observation stage. So one simple example is if you have xt plus 1, axt plus 
BUT and then I add the attacker signal UAT which is the attacker's input, if I add it in a way that is in the null space of B, then you are legitimately attacking the system but it will never get observed in XT plus 1. So those are known as stealthy attacks, so we'll come up with a very, uh, with a definition of what stealthy attack means. And then how do you define a stealthy attack and how do you detect and stealthy attack? So those are some of the things we will talk about. So stealthy attacks are, and yt plus one, cxt. So stealthy attacks are one where the attack here is not reflected in the expression for yt. So somehow the multiplication with this b and the multiplication with this c cancels each other out and the attack turns out to be in the null space so that yt doesn't reflect the actual attack that was inflicted on the system. Out of which, 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 which attack do you think is easier to detect? If you know what, how communication systems work, which of these attacks would be easier to detect? Like you can detect it instantly. Communication. Communication. Because whenever you are communicating, you are looking for acknowledgement, right? So you're looking for the way to know that the communication has been successful or not. So this one is extremely easy to detect because typically what happens when you are, uh, when, some, when the attacker is disrupting communication is that there is no legitimate communication happening in the network at all or you know that the communication is dropping every now and then. For instance, when it's, when it's jammed. So then it's extremely easy to detect because your acknowledgement is not coming back. You are the computer, you are the one sending the information. If there's no acknowledgement coming back, you know that things are not going well. There is an attack on the system. So detecting this is very easy. Detecting this is very easy. So we need to worry about detecting some of the other attacks. Influence the set point, you know, this attack, I, I have not seen it so far in the literature. Uh, but I'm sure it will, it will uh, eventually get into one of these different attacks, we can use these algorithms also to in see whether there is something that's influencing the set point or not. So we'll get back to it in a bit. Most likely, influencing the set point is similar to changing y of t or uh, changing the noise here. Uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens when you are influencing the set point. But, uh, but now we need to figure out, what, what, so now that we know hypothesis testing and we know control systems, we need to figure out how do we detect all of these attacks. So let's think about it. What are the ways to detect these attacks? This one, third one is easy to detect. Actually, let me write down. Uh, yeah, let's, let, well, let me think about, let me, okay. So, the computer, the attack detector, sees U1 to UT and Y1 to YT or ut minus one and y1 to yt and it needs to detect if some attack is happening or not. So th this is the information that's available with the detector. So the attack detector can potentially know all the control signal or it can know all the 
observations that are coming in. That's the information. Sometimes the control signal may not have, may not be there with the attacker. Depending on where the control signal is getting computed and where the observations are getting computed. Uh, if you think about a large, uh, what is that called? The chemical factory. So if it's a chemical factory or if it is an oil refinery, for instance, uh, the actuation might be happening way downstream from where the information is getting aggregated and the control signal is getting sent. So for instance, you can have like a pressure sensor which is downstream on, the, on, a, on a long pipe. So the sensor is going to sense what the uh, pressure is at that particular location. And then that information is going to be fed back to a computer which will be like in a centralized facility. And then that computer is going to send the control command back to that particular location or the actuator upstream from that particular sensor. So all of that is a place where the actuation and the observations are not co-located. I mean, there is a computer in between where all of this is happening. So sometimes uh, U1 to UT minus one may not be with the actuator, sometimes it will be, but at least this observation is the basis on which the attack needs to be detected. So now my question is, how exactly are you going to detect that there is an attack happening on the system. Now that we know a lot of machinery that will go into attack detection. So what will you do? What is it that you will, how will you pose this problem mathematically? Do we have system dynamics? You can assume a lot about system dynamics and uh, observation function and what the noise statistics look like. You can assume that all of that information is there with you. Because typically all of that is part of what is known as a spec sheet. So whenever you buy like a very complicated machinery, you get a specification seat, sheet and that will contain all that information that is needed to make the decision. So we know, okay, so what else do we know? We know FT, we know GT, we know noise statistics. Uh, what else do we know? We know gamma t. Yeah, those are the only things that you need to know. And we have this information vector. Let's consider the simple case. So let's consider yt equals to xt. So full information, full observation case. Let me simplify it further. So in this case, my xt plus one is equal to ft xt gamma t xt wt. This is unattacked dynamics. So I've done multiple simplifications here. I've assumed that yt equals to xt, and then gamma t only depends on the current state. It doesn't depend on any of the past states that we have seen so far. So this is what I'm seeing. This is my unattacked dynamics of the system. And I want to detect if there is an attack happening on the system or not. What can I do? But I don't know what the state is. All I'm doing is I'm observing. Like, uh, so, so yt equals to xt. Now I'm getting yt. I'm looking at y1 all the way up to yt. And this is the true state dynamics. This is how the state is evolving. But there's no way for me to know what the state is. The only way I know the state is through the observation, which I'm assuming that it's equal to state because I've never had an attack.
any thoughts the real question is are you able to trust your eyes should you trust your eyes so through your eyes you are getting complete observation and you are you know you are uh, how do you know that this is not imagination that's my question how do you know that this classroom is not an imagination it's really happening in 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 reality that is my question right so that's my unattacked dynamics so generally we assume that whatever we are observing is reality right so that's my unattacked dynamics and suppose there is an attack happening how do i know that this is fake and fake or real like that's my question Yeah, you can do estimation. Sure, you can do estimation. Assuming that the initial few so you assume that whatever you are seeing is reality, yes. but then there is no estimation required because my y t is equal to x t. So from my point of view, there is no estimation actually. Any thoughts? So we know what FT is, right? We know what FT is, we know what GT is. I mean, in this case, GT is very simple. Noise distribution, I guess, WT is the only noise we have here. And then gamma T is known. Let's assume that the adversary is somewhat stupid. Okay. How do you know that this is, uh, okay, so my, okay, <laughs> I'll ask a simpler, how do you know that this class is happening and it's not some imagination? What's the simple trick or simple test to know that this class is happening and it's not imagination? So look, one simple trick that I can say is, uh, Everything is following Newton's laws of motion. Okay, so if I if I throw the chalk, uh, it's following the Newton's laws of motion. Uh, if I'm asking a question, I get a response, which is actually an answer to that question. So I am able to make sense of the reality, and I'm I'm inclined to believe that this is actually reality because if it was fake, and I'm asking a question, I probably would get some random response, not a true response. So how do I how do I write that mathematically? Any thoughts? No. How about this? So I look at y t minus f t of. Okay, I, let me just assume that there is no t. This is constant, this is not time varying, and this is not time varying. Okay, just to make my life easy. Yt minus f, yt minus one, gamma yt minus one, w t minus one. Now the problem is I don't really observe the actuation noise. Okay, so this is unknown. This is unknown. I know the distribution, but I don't observe the actuation noise. I know what it, uh, what the probability density function or the probability mass function of this W T minus one is. Does this tell me something about? what's reality versus what's fake. If I am observing this sequence, and the adversary is stupid, so adversary is not going to make 
yt exactly equal to this. So if, if, if the adversary is able to make it exactly equal to this, then of course uh, I cannot detect. But otherwise I can keep generating my own noise. I can look at the difference. And if the difference seems to be very large, then it seems to me that something wrong is happening with the system. Okay. So I want in that particular situation, I want this WT minus one to be very small. Like for instance, in this room, um, if you look at the noise that we are adding to this room is actually very small in comparison to the, the way the thermal dynamics of this room function. For some reason, I feel that the AC is not working today. So <laughs> maybe somebody has attacked the AC, I don't know. Uh, but it's not working right now. Uh, but anyways, if WT minus one is very small, so I can kind of ignore it, I can set it equal to zero, and I look at this difference, and if the difference is large, is maintaining a very large value at all points of time, then I know that something is wrong, something is fishy. Because what will happen in reality is, if, it was, if there was no attack on the system, then xt minus f of xt, gamma xt, and wt, it's going to be small. Assuming WT is small. So this is akin to saying Oh, uh, maybe I should have t minus one here. So this is akin to saying that I'm looking at the dynamics of the room. I'm looking at looking at uh, whether Newton's laws of motions are being followed in this room or not. And as long as everybody is observing the Newton's laws of motion, and if I'm asking question, I'm getting a response which is real. Then in that case, I know that this is what the this is this error is actually very small. And then I can ignore it and I can say that, look, I think everything is working as intended. Uh, on the other hand, if this error is becoming larger and larger, as is the case here, then I know that something is wrong. So that's one way to detect it. Now, does that ring a bell? Can you pose this as a reasonable enough hypothesis testing problem? How would you pose this as a hypothesis testing problem? So this is a test that I pulled out of my hat but it's probably not the best test in the world, okay? So what can we, what can we come up with for a, in terms of a hypothesis testing? Like I want to pose this as a hypothesis testing problem. How should I pose it? What is my null hypothesis, H naught? And what is my alternate hypothesis? Any thoughts? Let me write it here. Yt is generated according to yt plus 1 equals to f of yt gamma yt wt. And then yt is not generated according to this, this uh, update equation. Okay, so this is my hypothesis. This is how I'm going to test it. This is going to be my hypothesis all throughout my uh, discussion for the rest of the semester. Now, of course, I'm going to make this a bit more complicated because depending on the attack model, 
you might have a different WT, you might have a different gamma, you might have uh, some history here, or you might have the uh, observation model as well. So depending on the situation, roughly, uh, uh, we are going to make some changes on this side of the equation, but more or less these two hypotheses are going to remain the same. So I know the observation process is generated according to a known dynamics versus the observation process is not generated according to the known dynamics. Now one of the problems with attack detection is any of the changes could be really anything, like the adversary can pick whatever gamma A it wants to pick, it can pick whatever WT it wants to pick, it can pick whatever observation it wants to pick because adversary generally have much more control over the system because it has hacked into the system, it has some, uh, some segue into sending information uh, within that network control system. So, uh, so that allows us, so that then, then this hypothesis testing problem becomes a bit complicated and the reason it is complicated is comparatively speaking, if you knew what the attack model is, Solving this hypothesis testing is comparatively easier because you know, because what you can say is in the alternate hypothesis, you can say yt is generated according to a tag model. So if you knew what the attack model was, if you knew how exactly the adversary is going to attack this particular system, it's much easier to come up with the hypothesis testing, but most likely, most, in most situations, you don't really know how the attack is going to be launched. And in that case, all you have is, either it's generated according to this law, or it's not generated according to this law. And so the two hypothesis testing problems have comparative, like comparatively speaking, the second one is far more complicated and far more difficult to run, but we'll study all of those. Uh, hypothesis testing problems. Uh, one small point I wanted to make here is, you know, I've been saying that it's very difficult to know what the attack model is. So sometimes what companies would do is they'll get penetration testers. I don't know if you know about pen testing. So they, they'll call pen testers. They are like, they are like white hat hackers. So they'll come into the system and they'll go, they'll start launching an attack. They'll start figuring out how to launch an attack. Okay. And once they, they'll, they'll charge you maybe a million dollars. Okay. For this building, they'll charge you a million dollars. They'll come here. They'll spend like three months figuring out what are the different ways I, by which I can attack this system. And then they'll launch an attack. And then you will know, okay, these are the ways by which attacks can be launched and this is the attack model. Okay, so there are some cases where the attack model can be deduced, but it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you people, which is like you need to hire people to be able to run those attacks. And you can get some sort of attack model in that particular scenario. But more often than not, you won't really have uh, all the information available in order to come up with the, the model of the system under attack. So something to keep in mind. <clears throat> okay, so here are broadly different ways of deducing the attack. Check if Support of Y has changed. You know what a support of a distribution is? Support of the distribution is the smallest set on which the probability is equal to one. So let's consider the uniform distribution. Uh, I'm going to define the density function as 1 over b minus a if 0 less than x less than a less than x less than b and it is 0 otherwise. So 
So the support is Okay, so support is the smallest set over which the probability distribution is equal to 1. So this is the smallest set. If you go outside the set, uh, you are only adding zero probability events. So this is known as support. So if you knew that yt can only take values between 0 and 1 and suddenly you saw the value of yt to be 1000, then you know that there is a problem. Right? If somebody tells me that the temperature of this room is 1000, I know that there is a problem because we know generally the temperature could be between 70 to 75. It could become 69, but it will never become 50 degrees Fahrenheit and it will never become 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, So you can check, in order to test the alternate hypothesis, you can check if the support of Y itself has changed. Sometimes, uh, I mean, support is a very broad term. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, so you have two dimensional observations. This is y1, this is y2. And you generally have observations that are appearing along this line. Okay, this is where the observation is. However, one day you find that the observations are coming like this. So the support has actually rotated to some extent. And then that allows you to check if there is an attack on the system or not. So support, checking if support has changed is one way to detect the attack has happened or not happened. Okay, any questions on this before I raise part? Okay. Check if the transition kernel so i'm looking at this conditional distribution p of yt plus 1 given yt and i'm going to check if that conditional distribution has changed or not here there could be two options Okay. Third is keep changing policy. And the fourth is add an authentication.
So this is what is what we can do in order to test this hypothesis. The first thing that I can do is check if the support of Y itself has changed or not. We are going to, we can use either neural networks to do it or any of the machine learning models to do it. Or we can use uh, uh, principal component analysis to do it. Okay, so this is what we will study first. Then we will check if this transition kernel, uh, this is known as a transition kernel or you can think of it as a conditional probability distribution. So check if this conditional probability distribution, in the unattack case, I, I know what this conditional probability distribution is. Now in the attack case, there could be two situations. First situation is I know what it will change to in the case of an attack. The other case is I really don't know how, where, what will happen during the attack scenario. So first we will study this particular case where we know exactly how the model is going to change under attack. And then we'll, we'll talk about algorithms for figuring out what to do when you don't know what the model is. And typically what happens in this situation is you spend the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes trying to figure out what the model is. Okay, you pick subsequent uh, readings and then you try to come up with an estimate Q hat. Now that you know Q hat, you can test whether this Q hat and this P look similar or they look very different. Okay, that's another way to test the attack. Then the third way to test the attack is I'm gonna keep changing my policy. And I'm going to see if YT is following the pattern that it's supposed to follow under different policy. So if I'm walking from here to there, and I see that chair is coming towards me, chair is coming nearer to me, and then I move in the opposite direction, and I see that the chair is moving away from me, then I know that I'm actually, this is the real world, this is not imagination, okay? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm changing my gamma t, and I'm checking if yt is following some known patterns or not. This is known as dynamic watermarking. We have done some work on this particular topic. And then the fourth case is, we are going to add an authenticating subsystem. So the idea is as follows. I have this temperature sensor in this room, and I have no control over this temperature sensor. It can get attacked at any point of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a smoke alarm in this room, okay? And by adding a smoke alarm, I now have an authenticating subsystem. So now if there is fire inside this room, the temperature sensor may not be telling me because whatever, it is compromised and the adversary is controlling the temperature reading that is coming to me. But because there is a smoke alarm and the adversary doesn't have access to the smoke alarm system, um, I will be able to know if there is an actual fire happening or the adversary is just changing the temperature to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, trying to inform me that this room is on fire when it's actually not on fire. So this is known as adding an authenticating subsystem. And so we'll talk about uh, once you add an authenticating subsystem, that subsystem's reading, that subsystem, by the way, this subsystem is supposed to be local in nature. So it's not connected to the internet. It's not something that can be hacked and all that stuff. Okay, so once you add an authenticating subsystem, uh, if it gets, if the original system gets attacked, because the authenticating subsystem is observing reading, which is correlated with the actual reading of the system, you can run some correlation detection and then you can figure out, okay, there is an attack happening or not happening, depending on what the actual system is saying and what the authenticating subsystem is saying. So that's another way to detect an attack. So broadly speaking, the subsequent few classes, we are just going to talk about all of these one, two, three, four, five different types of attack detection algorithms, okay? Any question? Okay, so always, so whenever you are thinking from a detection perspective, the only thing you need to think about is, are you in reality or not? Like, how do you know that you are actually in reality? That's the part, that's the missing piece. And whenever you think about attack detection, that's what you need to answer in your head. How do you know that you are real or not real? Because if an attack is happening on an autonomous vehicle, and if the LIDAR is getting spoofed or the radar is getting spoofed, uh, the autonomous driving still needs to know, the autonomous vehicle needs to know whether it's, what it's observing is reality or fake. And it's a very difficult problem, which is what we are going to be discussing. Awesome, so we'll meet, uh, 
so on wednesday there is class right okay so we'll meet you guys on wednesday and uh, then we have a break autumn break and then we'll meet again monday next week thank you